I'm Everett White with Bloomberg Quick Take. In late March, New York State moved to legalize recreational cannabis for adults, making it recreationally legal in 16 states, medically legal in 36 states, and at least decriminalized in 49 of 50 states. Legal weed seems to be at a tipping point, and two things are driving it. The potential for cannabis as a cash crop and the lost human potential from mass incarceration. Money and social justice are the two most important, most powerful arguments circulating in favor of cannabis legalization, from the number of people who would be free from the criminal justice system to the amount of business activity waiting to be unleashed. But which rationale is more expedient, has more traction? Which one might the Biden administration base any federal action on? And how do both of them figure into the future of a legal market? We're joined by Joyce Cutler and, and Tiffany Carey of Bloomberg News to find out. Joyce is a staff correspondent with Bloomberg Law. Tiffany is a consumer re reporter with Bloomberg News, focusing on cannabis, nicotine, and alcohol. They're going to break down the economic and judicial sides to cannabis legalization to see which is a better rationale. QT debate is a non-adversarial debate discussion, meaning we'll have you both speak to legalization. Tiffany from an economic and business perspective, and Joyce from a legal and social perspective. I'm gonna pose three questions during this debate which you'll both get a chance to discuss. We want to understand the issue of legalization with context and nuance, not just have an argument or have a winner. So Joyce and Tiffany, welcome. Let's jump into the first QT debate. I'm gonna ask you this first question. Federal legalization is looking more and more likely. Which rationale is driving that? The potential business and economic benefits of a new legal cannabis market? or the idea that legalization could reform criminal justice and repair damage done by the war on drugs. We're gonna start with Tiffany. Um, Tiffany, how do, you, how do you feel about that? Follow the money, always follow the money. I mean, cannabis in the US is now 22 billion a year. It's expected to be around 26 billion a year, um, pretty soon, according to Euromonitor. So these numbers are just really big. I think there's a lot of economic momentum here. And of course, one of the most popular arguments for legalizing cannabis is tax revenue. Right now, you have people who've been using cannabis for years. That's all in the illegal market. The government's not benefiting at all. Um, really, no one is except the black market dealers. So why not legalize that, make that tax benefit something the government can use um, ostensibly for good purposes? So. You know, right now, I think there's still a lot of debate over what the tax rates are going to be, but we've seen numbers as high as $100 billion in tax revenue that could come for this for, by 2025. So that's a big number. What are, what are some of the things that, that that tax revenue could be used for? Um, I know that the coronavirus and somewhat of the, some of these, these state coffers being you know, depleted by, by lessening tax revenues have affected you know, the economies of states. What, what sorts of things could, be, could these tax revenues be used for? Well, I think on the state level, there's a lot of talk of putting them towards social justice reform. And perhaps where, that's where I should hand the argument over and, and we can talk about you know, how that works. Yeah, Joyce, I, I want to pivot to you a little bit. What what sorts of, um, I guess, social justice initiatives would come from that? Well, part of it would be, um, right off the bat, would be training, um, giving people an opportunity to succeed. Uh, when you have, and this is all wrapped up with, so, with social justice and criminality, when you have people who've been, uh, who have marks on their record, uh, who have been arrested, that prevents them from getting jobs, that prevents, uh, hurts them in housing. Billions of dollars you know, are lost each year because people can't get jobs. Uh, when you talk about um, social, when you talk about legalization, you have to include social justice and you have to include social equity, which starts off with getting rid of the convictions and then creating ways for people to get, educate, to get education and training, maybe even open up their own cannabis shop because they have they have an expertise there. They have some skill there. Uh, that's where social you know the social equity issue comes in, and it was a component in New York and many other states in California and Illinois. Um, Iowa is considering um, expungement, um, and, and it's uh, as it's, it's legislature debates legalization. So there are economic reasons for social equity, um, and there are if you if you know, for, for plain justice issues. Uh, so those who were harmed by the war on drugs for so many years can get benefits from it. 
Right. And I, I want to um, sort of talk a little bit more about, about the, the social justice aspects of it. We, we know that minority um, people, people of black and brown descent, they, they, they are more likely to be arrested for cannabis we, and despite using it at a, at a similar rate to, to white people. Um, what sorts of remedies, you said expungement, Joyce, um, what, sorts of, what other sorts of remedies do you see for that in cannabis legalization? Well, uh, part of it is uh, letting people who have been uh, who are in communities that were most harmed by the war on drugs getting to the head of the line when it comes to licensing, uh, when it comes to loans, when it comes to financial backing to uh, open uh, open up uh, operations. Uh, it can, be, as I said, it can include education and training. Um, the big thing about you know because the money is involved as much in social justice as it is in just pure tax revenue. Um, Cause it, you know, cause it costs $81,000 a year to incarcerate someone in California. Hmm. Um, that, and, and a fifth of the people in, in, in California and in, in incarcerated are there for drug, drug, drug crimes. Uh, and that's where some of the federal legislation comes in as well uh, because the few, uh, that's money we could use for something else. Um, if you add uh, what it costs to incarcerate and you know, what it costs to enforcement, it ends up to be about $13 billion a year. Um, that's a lot of public school education. Uh, that's a lot of opportunities we could create by really just taking away the illegality of something that, is, that the majority of states have said, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. Right. And the, you, you mentioned the opportunity there. I want to go back to Tiffany just one more second before we go to the next question to sort of um, expand on that. What, what sorts of opportunities economically do you see um, for both minorities and just people in general, Tiffany? Yeah, I think a lot of what Joyce said ties into the second big argument here, which is not just tax revenue, but jobs. I mean, you look at New York State alone, there's a prediction that legalizing or going from medical to recreational markets is going to create 60,000 jobs. Um, a lot of these are fairly high paying jobs as well, too. That's something the cannabis industry likes to point out. I think nationwide, the number is something like uh, one and a half million new jobs would be created by legalizing. So clearly, you know, whether those jobs are going to minority applicants, as we hope will be the case with some of these programs or not you know, job creation is something that's going to be really of interest to the Biden administration. Gotcha. That, that's a great way to, that's a great point to pivot to the next question. Um, Joyce and Tiffany, uh, we're here talking about the potential benefits to opening a legal cannabis market, but there are still concerns about cannabis legalization. What sorts of cons are there to reforming its status, both economically and politically? Um, Joyce, I'll start with you. What, what sorts of cons are there? Well, politically, uh, there's been the decades-long challenge saying, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug. Uh, there's concerns about cannabis operations uh, increase crime. Um, those are really hard, long-term, uh, ingrained beliefs that require you know, you, you counter with education. Uh, you have uh, some. You, know, you have religious objections. Uh, people who, who who see it as a as a moral or religious issue, not just a legal issue. Again, education. What has happened? What what has changed since you know since cannabis has been legalized? You know, Chuck Schumer said today the doom and gloom they talked about when Colorado and Washington legalized didn't materialize, and that's part of the education. That's part of the understanding of the whole issue of let's get rid of the criminalization when we already have it in society. Uh, we have a ready market for it in society. It, 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 is, an, it is a slow education because people have come around. Seven, ne nearly seven in 10 voters in the latest, Quinnip in, in the latest Quinnipiac poll supported legalization. That's mm. up from 51% you know, less than 10 years ago. Right. Tiffany, I want to pivot to you there. What, what sorts of cons are there on, on the business side? What are business leaders or the, the sort of economists or anybody on that side saying um, with regard to, to POP? How, how are they sort of um, working to rein, rein legalization in? I think the main concerns economically about legalizing come from the public health standpoint. I mean, there are obviously some public health benefits to legalizing, right? In the black market, people don't know what they're buying. 
We've heard of overdoses of people getting addicted to things they didn't even know they were taking. So that's, you know, a benefit from a public health standpoint to legalizing. But there are some studies that have come out recently in the states where recreational use has become legal. And they show that adolescents are more likely to use marijuana once it's legalized for recreational use. I think it's something about just having more access to it. So, for example, one study showed that um, adolescents were 23% more likely to use marijuana and that it was even more marked in the younger people, like seventh graders, ninth graders, 11th graders. So you look at what, say, the vape industry has gone through, what the tobacco industry has gone to through the kind of public health cost that comes from trying to help kids that become addicted. Um, and I think that's a concern from an economic standpoint. There's a whole sort of vein of thinking about cannabis use disorder. You know, a lot of people say, oh, cannabis isn't addictive because it doesn't create the kind of withdrawal that you see with heroin. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of public health agencies have said, no, a cannabis use disorder, which is a sort of addiction where people become psychologically or sort of emotionally dependent on it is real. And, you know, if we have more of that, that's that's a cost to society in dealing with that. We both look at things, in, you know, in, in a real money sense. You know, when you when when you're buying, go down to your friendly neighborhood drug you know you know drug dealer. Go down to your friendly neighborhood cannabis shop. When I buy something, I know it's been tested. I know it's been it's it's been vetted. I know I have to go through security to get there, slashing my uh, my driver's license to get in, and then slashing my driver's license again to buy it. Um, it's uh, it, it it it's it's like any other transaction. Uh, and you get people who are knowledgeable versus when I buy it from the illicit market, you don't know what where it's grown, you don't know how it was grown, you don't know with what chemicals, it's not been tested, it's not been validated, uh, it's not, you know, the people who grew it uh, may have been treated, mistreated, may have been dosed with, with chemicals themselves, mm -hmm. um, they didn't get unemployment, they didn't get workers' comp, um, you know, it's, it, and all that is, is a real societal cost when you have an illicit market. Right. I do want to bring up another point about the, the legal market that, that we haven't sort of touched on. Um, the HR 1996, um, which would allow banks and credit unions to provide financial services to state authorized cannabis businesses without federal penalties, it's being considered this week. Um, the, the sort of use of cash for cannabis businesses in legal states has been a point of contention. It's been a way for them to sort of be kept out of the, the the regular financial system. How does legal, how does this bill, HR 1996, how does that benefit the cannabis industry? I'll, I'll start with, with you, Tiffany. Thanks, yeah. I mean, I think it's gonna be really beneficial for a lot of these companies. Uh, it's the, known as the Safe Banking Act. It will allow them to bank, quote, safely, um, or rather allow the banks to deal with the cannabis companies safely without being afraid of, of legal repercussions. So we, it's really hard to imagine the sort of headaches that these companies have faced, you know, getting uh, armored vehicles to move their cash everywhere. Imagine trying to pay a tax bill, you know, in all cash. Um, it's even been hard for them to do things, basic functions of payroll. So I think this is probably the least controversial of the cannabis bills that have been put out there, but it's definitely something that's going to benefit the industry and help these companies. And on the legal side, Joyce, what what sorts of um, what sorts of considerations are there for that that bill HR nineteen ninety six? How does how does this sort of um, aid in in you know lessening the the judicial workload, so to speak, for for cannabis? Well, for the uh, most basic one is just issues of security. Uh, I was talking to uh, the owner of uh, one 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 operation, and they were bringing their cash to the bank in Trader Joe's bags. Um, Trader Joe's bags are wonderful for many things, but perhaps not, you know, thousands of dollars of cash. Uh, you have, um, when you have secure banking, when you have a legitimate banking system uh, that, that, that someone can tap into, uh, it reduces, the, the, it, you know, the possibility of crime issues. Because you can, you know, if you do, if you have an all cash business, that's very appealing to, to, to someone who wants to, to perhaps take that off your hands, illegally or otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. When you have... Uh, a banking system, uh, you also have a way to, again, with social equity, increase the opportunity for people who, have, who could access loans and other uh, uh, means to open up 
that if they've tapped out their friends, relatives, and don't know many venture capitalists. Um, from a legal standpoint, uh, yeah, I, I, having worked in retail, dealing with cash, having worked at restaurants, that kind of stuff, you know, cash can be a real drag to deal with just because you have to handle it. Um, it's you know, electronic transactions are, are, are much preferred. Right. And so another sort of consideration that I've, that I've noticed is, is that Mexico, they in the last month, they their 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 government has moved to legalize cannabis, making the U.S. the last in North America to not have it legalized. What sorts of implications does that have um, just in terms of, you know, the U.S. positioning itself and then also the U.S. positioning itself as, as a business leader, but also as the, the I guess, the the judicial leader of, of North America. Um, it's it's a wider question, but I'd love to get you guys' take on it. Uh, Joyce, I'll start with you there. I know you, you're more um, on the, the state level side and more on the judicial side than the, than the international side, but I'd love to get your take on it. Well, having, uh, you know, quite frankly, having two neighbors next to us where, where cannabis is legalized, just like in the States, does create more pressure on the US. Um, it, it, and it's a trade issue. Um, when, uh, let's face it, U.S. has a really good reputation in certain areas for the quality of cannabis. Uh, you know, you talk about the Emerald Triangle of California, certain areas that are well regarded for, for, for the cannabis crop and have been for, for decades. Um, U.S. would be seeding that reputational issue by not legalizing. Um, it would be, uh, as, as any other, it would be along the line of any other trade issue that could be negotiated. Uh, one thing, and I want to get you know talk about California has uh, an Appalachians project, much like we have for wine. When you say you're buying a Pinot from Russian River, California, you know what you're getting. There may be variations in taste, but you know kind of quality and what it's going to get. Same thing with if you could buy, buying cannabis. So when you buy cannabis from the Russian River or from Humboldt County, you know what you're getting, and that's the state certification saying it is what it says it is, mm. and. It's a competitive issue. It goes back to you want its reputation, its brand, and as always, its money. Um, because U.S. You know, has been uh, you know, over the years has has, has ceded ground to, to other countries on certain issues. Um, this is this is a homegrown issue. Um, right. Going back to yeah. right. George Washington growing hemp. Right. I want to bring Tiffany in. What, what, what were you going to say there? Yeah, I just want to point out, you know, with Canada having legalized in 2018, there's been so much U.S. money that has flowed into those Canadian companies. And you hear that talked about more and more. You know, these Canadian companies are legal for big institutional investors to invest in because federally cannabis is legal in Canada. Um, there are these U.S. multi-state operators that are doing quite well financially, yet they don't have the same sort of financial support network from U.S. investors. So, you know, basically you're seeing all this wealth from U.S. flow into Canadian companies. If Mexico legalizes, that creates one more place where you're going to have these strong companies developing. They'll attract U.S. investment income. A lot of people say, look, it just makes more sense to have U.S. companies legalize or be legal in a, in a federally legal framework so that money can stay in the States. I think that, you know, the black market has been a huge competitor and obviously some of that product um, may come from Mexico. So this is just giving Mexican companies another chance to sort of join what seems to be a wave of legalization in other countries and also become more multinational players. I mean, if you think about, U.S. companies in the consumer space, right? You've got big tobacco companies making Marlboros. You have Procter & Gamble, you know, as a consumer goods company. You have Molson as like a leading beer company. If cannabis is eventually going to be legal in the U.S. and in many countries, why wouldn't you want U.S. companies to get sort of a leg up now and have a chance at becoming the sort of big multinational companies? that sell cannabis or cannabis related products around the world. Right. I, and you, you raise a, you raise a point that Joyce brought up a, a while ago about the black market and how it's sort of, um, 
adds or it takes away from that that certified um, that certification that that Joyce was bringing up. How if you get something from the 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 Emerald Triangle, you know that it's something great, and you know that it, it's it's going to be a, a product that's that that that, that has a, a certain quality to it. And you know the 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 idea that America could lead this this industry or have some sort of foothold in it is something that 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 appeals to lawmakers it appeals to to people across the political and economic spectrum so i just wanted to widen it out widen the 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 widen it out for this this last question guys um and you know feel free to, to chime in here because i i really want to get your take on it um you know with with new york moving to legalize it uh cannabis legalization seems to be at a tipping point and you know, we can't predict when or or how it'll happen. But what what's next? What sorts of frameworks could you see coming in into play in the next few years? What sorts of policies could you see, you know, being enacted that would that would you know be be sort of a banner for for cannabis legalization in the U.S.? I'll start with you, uh, Tiffany. Yeah. Thanks. I think there's so much interest right now in what it is that Senators Cory Booker, Chuck Schumer, and Ron Wyden have been working on. You know, it's expected any day that there's going to be this Booker Schumer Wyden proposal, uh, and it might sort of wipe out these other things we've seen before, like the Moore Act or the States Act, and really propose a comprehensive framework for cannabis. Apparently, you know, social justice is really high on the agenda for them. So this is going to be something they've thought a lot about um, and have a, have a sort of unique approach to. And the past bills, the past proposals, they didn't really take a lot of the regulatory uh, nitty gritty into, into consideration. And apparently uh, what we could expect from this is, you know, a little bit more guidance on what people like the FDA would do when it comes to cannabis, which of course is in so many things from, you know, dietary supplements to creams and topicals, not just um, smoke. So I think that if that comes out in the next few weeks and, and gets a lot of traction, that could really change things quite quickly. Yeah. Joyce, your, your take on it? The money issue, the banking issue is the first one. Um, because if you, if you take away that part, uh, of of the of the bound of 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 creating boundaries, it, it allow the market to flourish, the legal market to flourish quite well. Um, if you take away uh, the uh, issue of you know expungement and criminality and getting rid of that, that opens up uh, billions of dollars in potential uh, for people to work, to for taxes, for economy. Uh, if you also engage in people, you know, with the people who've been involved in the industry. Uh, it, you'll find there's a lot of similarities with different, uh, I, I go back to wine, there's a lot of similarities in the, the, the issues, the environment, the employment, the you know, labor issues, how do you get the right people? Um, there's, there's a lot of commonalities that can, be, that, 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 you know, that can be brought to discussion, but we have to start with the banking. That, mm. That's the first step. So once we start with the banking, um, you know, with a, a, a you know legis legislation like HR nineteen ninety six or the 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 Schumer Wyden Booker um, bill that's supposedly upcoming, what what sorts of changes do you see you know in coming in just U S culture around cannabis now that it will be legal? How do you see the just the the way it's treated um, maybe on the ground change over the next few years? Well, I think about enforcement, you know. I mean, if we like we in California at the city level and then at the state level have made it le made it less of an issue, it, maybe the cops can do have other things they can pay attention to. Um, as far as uh, consumption, you know, you know, if you don't allow smoking, you know, uh, cigarettes or if you don't allow drinking on uh, a school play yard, no change there. Um, so some, yeah, having lived in California with, 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 where we've had uh, with with, uh, with with legal cannabis. I really don't see that much of a change uh, in, in terms of society. Um, I do see storefronts opening up. I do see people employed. I do see people who are very well trained and educated who can help you match what you want. Just like if you go into the drugstore and say, I've got an ache here, you go into a cannabis dispensary, say, I'm having this, that, and the other. This is what I want. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a very, uh, it, it's like going to a you know, wine shop saying, I, I want this. I'm having this with dinner. So, 
just an acceptance of, of the way it is. Mm. Tiffany, uh, as, a, as a consumer reporter, how do you feel about that? What do you see on like coming on the horizon? I think one of the biggest questions is what these really big alcohol and tobacco companies are going to do with their stakes uh, in cannabis companies. They've already thrown a lot of their lobbying power into these issues. Um, they've taken significant stakes um, in cannabis companies. So, you know, are more pharmaceutical companies, other types of consumer goods companies going to get into the cannabis business? I mean, cannabis is just something that cuts across so many different things from health and wellness to serious pharmaceuticals to recreational use. So I think once it's federally, or if it becomes federally legal in the U.S., which it seems more and more likely, it's just such an important question to all these industries, tobacco, alcohol, health and wellness, dietary supplements. Um, and I think the other big thing to watch for really is more debates or decisions around potency levels. It's something we've seen increasing discussions of potency levels have been really rising. And I think there's a lot of questions around things like, well, do you cap things that are really high THC? Do you tax potency levels? Um, and there's just so much to work out from a regulatory standpoint, from um, drug testing at jobs to um, driving questions. So there'll be a lot of interesting regulatory and business decisions ahead. Okay, you know. Last question. We'll get you guys both both quickly here. Um, in 2021, does cannabis get legalized on a federal level? Uh, Joyce, what do, what do you think? I think it has a better chance than it has ever had in my lifetime. Um, it's April. We've had you know four states already legalize it. Um, you know, we've got another you know another four or five states in the in the, in the wings. You know, it's 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 pretty much the the the, the feds have to catch up with the states. So uh, my money's on yeah. Okay. What about you, Tiffany? What do you think? Well, I'm torn. I think some people say 2021, some people say 2022. I think something that people increasingly talk about is decriminalization as opposed to full legalization with the states getting more authority to just have the law that they have already developed or to develop something of their own. And that's something that really benefits these big multi-state cannabis companies. So you can see there's definitely a, an economic rationale for them and, and they're pushing for that. Many Got, of them. It. Got it. Well, you know, that's a great place to wrap it up with Joyce and Tiffany. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us on the first QT debate. On, on Twitter, you can find Joyce at Joyce A. Cutler and or Joyce Cutler, and you can find Tiffany at Tiffany Carey. Um, Check out Tiffany's Cannabis Weekly Newsletter. Make sure to subscribe to Bloomberg Law to see Joyce's coverage of the judicial system. And be sure to tune into Quick Take on all social and streaming channels. I'm Everett White. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.